Avery. You're still connecting, Bree. Are you still connecting audio? Hi, Bree. Can you hear me? Oh, hold on. She's still connecting audio. Okay. Well, let's see what's happening with her. Great guest here today, Dr. Neil Schillenfeld. And we are so happy to have him. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, before we start everything, uh, I want to um, introduce our awesome uh, GB uh, stands for <laughs> uh, that work really hard to bring everything together for you guys. I start with my president elect, Madam Tani English. Hi. Then I move to our secretary, Janine Gershon. Hi there. Our program director, Christopher Wookie. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, nearly our membership director is gonna join us uh, a bit later today, but then we have our great treasurer, Bree Henderson. Hello and welcome. Hi, Bree. Thank you so much for conducting this uh, webinar. So we are back to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining us and being here today. We are so lucky to have our amazing guest speaker with us today, Dr. Neil Scherholz. And before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our Women's Council Realtor sponsors. You guys are awesome. So we are so lucky to have Dr. Neil Scherholz with us today. Dr. Neil Scherholz is um, a licensed psychologist with more than 16 years of experience in clinical psychology. He is the owner of the Angeles Psychology Group, located on Bullshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. And you may have seen him on the news lately discussing mental health questions related to COVID-19. So is there anything else that we, you'd like to add, Dr. Scherholz, before we get started? I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I love this kind of stuff. Um, like you said, I am interviewed occasionally, and usually it's just this sort of, you know, sort of a little canned sometimes. I like that we can all be engaged here, and I'm looking forward to any questions at all. And yes. Yeah. Yes. So please feel free to type in as many questions as you'd like in the chat box. Um, we will be going to answer those a little bit closer towards the end. But of course, like Dr. Scherholz said, this is an engaging conversation and we really want you all to participate and we encourage it. So let's go ahead and get started. So we are all adjusting to this new lifestyle and officials are asking people to stay at home and shelter in place. And so Dr. Scherholz, how may people be feeling right now and why may be why may they have these emotions uh, you know we could almost do a poll of everyone that is here with us and we would get a sense of how everyone's feeling it runs the gamut from the feelings of anxiety uncertainty depression feeling of wanting to reach out for uh, chemicals, substances, alcohol, food, under-exercising, over-exercising, under-sexing, over-sexing. Everything that 
was probably there for anyone before COVID-19. And this has just sort of raised it up to the conscious level of awareness, raised it up to the surface. What I'm seeing is anxiety, depression, and lots of feelings of stress and uncertainty because none of us, and I don't have any magic answers here, none of us know what is to come. It's very true. It's very true. Those are all really great points. You know, something that I hear often now is people talk about their anxiety levels. And so what, what do you think are the main stressors of anxiety right now? You know, I think we talk about anxiety, what that is, what that feels like. I'd like, because we've got some time here today, I'd like to also you know, psychology is not, I always like to say to my patients, psychology is not rocket science. Um, all of you are armchair psychologists. All of you have a sense of your emotional state, that of others, how that works. I want to sort of pull back the curtain and also share with you some of the theory. So for instance, let's start with anxiety. And let me define anxiety and what is clinically the body. Anxiety, yeah, right? Because, like, what is that? So, when there's some sort of an innate biological drive from within, from our core, this could be uh, fear, anxiety, certainly, um, longing and yearning, uh, anger sadness, grief, these sorts of very core emotions, when they attempt to reach some kind of expression, if that is thwarted, that creates problems. So for instance, let's say you have a feeling of want to, wanting to scream out with terror. This is like, you know, we see this with infants and babies, right? They will do it because they're not armored yet. So they have this impulse, they scream, they yell out. Well, as adults, we don't do this. We stop it, we armor it, and that gets stuck inside. When that energy, and I'm talking about actual galvanic skin response, plas you know, movement of energy, electronic movement of energy in the body, when that gets thwarted and it doesn't have a way of discharging through yelling or screaming or crying out, something like that, when it gets blocked, it's sort of like it recycles and circulates in the body and what creates anxiety. So I gave that long theory and now I've forgotten your question. Bring me, <laughs> bring me back to it. <laughs> uh, yes, that's actually question? like a great description. Well, it was just, what were the main drivers of anxiety right now? And it's beautiful that you actually explained it in such detail, because my next question was, was going to be, what are the symptoms are of anxiety? But you explained it so eloquently, it, it covers basically both of those things. And yeah. you talk about the body's reaction. What, what is the body's natural reaction to, to stress? Is it similar to anxiety? Well, this, yes. Diff different. Anxiety, I would say, is a manifestation of stress that's unique to each person. And um, someone could experience feelings of sh so many things. It could be feelings of shutting down. It could be an overall pervasive sense of unwellness and unsafety in the world. It could be situationally specific. Um, people can then also directed toward an object or a situation which we call a phobia, right? Mm, okay. Interesting. Yeah, so that's another, another sort of distorted or through the side door manifestation of anxiety. Um, what we know in the body is, and many of you know this, that um, you're going to have an increase in cortisol when you're stressed or anxious. And we know how detrimental this is to the body's biochemical functioning. For instance, you know, those of us who try to keep on muscle mass, cortisol will 
quickly reduce your muscle mass. So this, it, we have this negative downward spiral. We're trying to stay healthy. We're trying to exercise at home. We're trying to maintain our muscle mass. We're stressed. It goes, takes us in the opposite direction. Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. So you mentioned high cortisol levels in your body. So what are some other symptoms that we may be experiencing because of this pandemic? Well, I've, I've definitely, see, I would say the main things that I've seen in my practice um, are increases, particularly in alcohol and substance use. Um, I, I know, I, I don't know what the statistic is now. A few weeks ago, uh, the sales of alcohol in Los Angeles County were up 55%. 55% compared to a year ago. So wow. huge increase in alcohol sales and that probably translates to consumption. So I, I'm seeing that, you know, we've seen all the jokes, we've seen the memes, we've seen on social media, the jokes about eating and, you know, all of that increases in eating, especially carbs, sort of comfort foods. And what I want to say about this is rigid prohibitions, mandates, demands on oneself to not do that. I do not encourage or support that. So if you find yourself drinking more, if you find yourself reaching for cannabis, if you find yourself eating more, okay, or Netflixing more, whatever it is, I want everyone to go very easy on themselves with that right now, and then become mindful. But rigid prohibitions, mandates like, I will not do this, or this is wrong, or telling others, I don't, I don't support that because what your organism, what your body's trying to do, your psychology is trying to do, is to manage this as best you can with those sorts of things. So back to your question, those are the big things I'm seeing is sort of, is behavioral acting out. Mm. Very interesting, very interesting. And uh, to follow up with that, uh, just how do people, since they're experiencing these emotions, how do they deal with them in your experience? You know, what's the best way to cope with these overwhelming feelings? Yeah, I think that so many of the strategies that we've had have been taken away. First and foremost, we're social beings. And we all know, I mean, here I am, I'm looking at you, Brie, on the screen. I'm not looking at my camera. So you're not getting the eye contact. This is something we don't get when we're working virtually, which we all are now, right? Um, I'm seeing all of my patients online now, for instance. So for instance, being social creatures, getting a hug, taking a walk, being sexual, having a meal together without the constraints of a mask, social distancing, this has all been taken away from us. So it's, it makes it much more difficult to manage these emotions. So it's calling on all of us to dig deeper into our, our own psychology. So Perhaps you were already uh, had some propensity for anxiety. This crisis has brought that out more. It's an opportunity to delve deeper and to look at it. Same with depression, which I'm seeing more of, and particular panic and anxiety, which I already mentioned, panic and terror even. So reaching out as best we can to people we care about online communities, that's where it's gotta be, or you're gonna be doing social distance walking. I mean, I'm not saying anything to your audience here that they haven't already heard about, or they know, or they figured out on their own. But being mindful, and especially going easy on oneself, not giving yourself carte blanche approval to just you know, act out in whatever way, but to, to be easy and not harsh and judgmental, because that will, that's like 
hammering the steel on the anvil, it only makes it more defensive and harder. Yes, yes, I could see that definitely. I like the idea that you had about being connected while still being apart. You know, some people really relied on those connections to feel better. You know, some, sometimes they, if they're feeling sad, they reach out to friends or they call them or they would go to, to their house or do a workout together. Now things are very different, very, very different. So virtual connection, is that basically the same thing in our minds? Like, does our body react the same way when we're connecting to people virtually? This is such a brilliant question. The answer is unfortunately no. And I'll tell you why. I already, met, it's, it's, I already mentioned the eye contact. So, and we're gonna see, I'm very curious to see the research on the sort of the next generation, not just because of COVID-19, but because of the onset of relating through a screen. We're not making eye contact. Like I look up and I see your little boxes up there, <laughs> but we're not each making eye contact in the same way we would if we were in person. And we know, we know, especially for the infant, the newborn, that energetic eye contact between caregiver, you know, and infant, newborn, is vital to the development of the optic nerve, the occipital ridge, and the occip occiput in the brain. I'm pointing back here on my own brain. Um, all those areas. So this is compromised. And I'm not sure what's, what we're gonna find or what the implications will be. To answer your question, it's not the same. There are also, I will also say this, and this is not um, from any research or that I've been taught. I think we can all agree there's a lot more that goes on here in this world and universe than we understand. And there's so many questions that haven't been asked and so many questions that are unanswered. We don't know what the energetic contact is or what that means between two people entirely yet. And that is compromised when we're meeting through a screen electronically. Right, right. Well, that is very interesting information. It's very fascinating because I know some of our audience here have young children at home. So, so how can we help support and care for our children since there's this new social connection now that they're, they're not going to have? Yeah, I, um, can I make one more comment about what we were just talking about? Please do. I think your audience, everyone's like in real realty, right? Realtors and associated with, yeah. Yes. And though you're working with documents and figures and tangible property, really you're working with relationships. And I think you all, right? You're working with how do I connect? What, is, what does a home mean for this person? And how do I put together the right package for this person? I mean, I don't know your work that well, but I've certainly bought houses. And so I have some sense of what you do. Um, and it's so important in your work, right? The face-to-face. -face. It established. Yes that foundation of trust. So that goes back to the virtual versus, you know, it's something for all of you to be thinking about as you're doing your work and the implications and how that deep trust that you're looking to establish with your clients may be a little compromised through the virtual setting. Yeah. About kids, what I would say about kids, similar, weirdly, that I'm gonna conflate and put these together, Folks who are struggling with addiction is structure is very, 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 very important. We know this, and I want to give you a little bit of the theory behind why structure is important for kids. Because as our brains are developing, there's so much stimulus and so much we're taking in. And if each new piece of information we have to completely process every time, we will become overloaded. The brain, the mind can't do it. So 
what the mind does, and this is part of human development, psychological development, is the mind starts to have these schema, these schemata. Okay, that's what this is. I'm going to categorize that there. This is what I do at this time of the day. So structure, categories, which comes online around age like three or four kids start to categorize other than gender, which unfortunately is the first categorization, but that's another story we can get into if you want to talk about identity politics. <laughs> um, okay. All of this is important for kids, the structure, okay? So right. for the parents out there, you want to have a structure. That's one thing. The other thing I'll say, which goes back to you're hearing a theme here, parents are suddenly not able to use the village to care for their kids. They don't have the teacher, they don't have the babysitter, they don't have the nanny, they don't have the grandma, they don't have whoever it might be, right? Right. Okay, suddenly they're called upon 24 seven to be everything, nurse, teacher, mother, father, caregiver to this little child. And many of the parents that I work with, many of the couples and pa pa patients I have who are parents, you know, they, they want to kill their kids right now. And I just want to say, allow, allow that again without harsh judgment, because it is so hard right now. So if you have to park your kid in front of the TV for 45 minutes or an hour and a half so that you can go take a shower by five o'clock in the afternoon, I give you permission to do that. <laughs> it's not going to destroy your child's mind. So structure and then going easy. This is, not e this is not easy on anyone. Go easy on yourself. That's what I would say to parents. I love that so much because I feel like it's very important for people to just remember that note, just to be easy on yourself. And it's okay to do things to make it easier for yourself because like you said it's it's a big shift going from someone's um you know just one role and then now you have to do so many more and wear so many different hats so it's very important and and speaking of going easy on yourself mindfulness and meditation you know people are saying oh well meditating should help with mindfulness and keeping you calm and less anxious. How do you feel about, um, I guess, meditation right now? Yeah, I'm gonna make one more comment about parenting. I keep going back to you because as I listen to you, more ideas come and then we'll talk mindfulness. And Please share, absolutely. So again, I'm gonna peel back the curtain and I want all the parents out there to know that all the research shows conclusively, a child can get by and be just fine with one, it only takes one good enough caregiver. And I wanted to find good enough because that's an important term. You don't have to have two, you don't have to have one. This could be clergy, this could be a teacher, this could be an aunt, this could be a parent. And by good enough, what I mean is you are not aiming for perfection. This is why it's a park the kid in front of the TV. This is a weird time. I don't generally want you doing that, but now it's okay. To be good enough simply means to be attuned, paying attention most of the time. You're gonna mess up. You're gonna have your own feelings. There's absolutely bandwidth for that. You do not have to be perfect. I want parents to know that. Just be good enough. And good enough is a clinical term in the research. So now, shall we move on to meditation and mindfulness? Absolutely. Okay. All the research across the board shows that meditation and mindfulness are beneficial for mental health, especially anxiety, especially depression. So what do, and what else does the research show? Some folks who are, you know, yogis and meditative, you know, yo, how, what do I want to say? I don't know, like 
new age, you know, kind of aficionados, they will want to be meditating for an hour, two hours, you know, like that. What we right. know is that the benefits of meditation, if you are doing five to 15 minutes, you are getting all the benefits. It doesn't take very long at all. Graphically, after 15 minutes, it plateaus. If you meditate for 20 minutes or two hours, you're not really going to get more benefits than if you're in that sweet spot of five to 15 minutes. It doesn't take much, six minutes. What does this mean? Some people, prayer and meditation are different. Prayer is usually a, uh, a, a more of a request. Meditation is more of a quieting of the mind and a, there are many different forms of meditation. But you can, pretty much I prescribe it for most everyone. There is an exception and I should make note of this. For folks with some psychotic process, which is unlikely to be any of you know, the folks in the audience here, but I do have them in my practice where there's some psychosis, okay, delusions, even to the point of hallucinations, auditory or somatic or visual, seeing things. So if there's some kind of psychosis, it is not indicated. And the other, uh, if you're prone to dissociation, meaning sort of zoning out, the best way I can describe dissociation is when we drive, and you're not really paying attention, and then you get to your destination. That's a mild form of dissociation that we all have. But if you're really prone to checking out and zoning out, it's often from trauma, you know, a history of trauma can induce this, then meditation is generally not indicated because you go too far away. And same with psychosis. But in general, it's good for sure. That's good. That's very good to know. Yes, that's um, people actually talk about the difference between five to 10 minutes versus 20 minutes or an hour of meditating. So it's really good to know that you get all the benefits with just five minutes. Five to 15 is, uh, is the sweet spot. Five to 15. Just aim for that, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Just as well if you can do it at the same time every day. Okay, and does it matter where you're located, is it best to be at the same spot each time as well? You know, I don't know the research on that. My own, this is my own opinion. It's a personal, not a professional opinion would be, yeah, do it at the same place. But I don't know the research on that. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So another thing with today's technology um, we, we just talked about mindfulness and meditating. So with today's technology, it's, it's difficult for some to disconnect because we're constantly being given notifications of breaking news. We go to our TV, we see it. We're on our phones, we see it. So in your experience, what advice do you have for people about monitoring the news right now? So many things come up. There's monitoring the news, there's screen time, there's social media. I don't know what, where to start because I don't want, I want to, I don't want to lecture too much. Um, Wonderful information. Please share as much as you'd like. I think what I'd like to, I think what I'd like to say is this. Let, let's start with this, which is a little off what you asked me. I want to share the three main ways of discharging excess biophysical energy. When we started talking about anxiety, I defined that as an inability to find an outlet for an in internal drive. There are three main outlets. Meaningful work, which for many people has been compromised. Knowledge, or ways to increase knowledge. Um, exercise, and sexual activity. I said three. Really, it's work, exercise, and sexual activity. Um, and even sexual activity has been compromised during this because couples are together. They may have more discord. There may be less 
sexual activity. And for single people, especially if they're not able to date or have their sex, their sex partner or partners, that's being compromised significantly as well. So um, what was, take me back to your question again, because I went off, oh, I know what I was, the social media. This is yes. what I was gonna say. <laughs> so I advise for all of my patients that in your bedroom, your bedroom should be for sleeping, sexual activity, and dressing, nothing else. I always advise to have all screens out of the bedroom. This includes phones. So you should have an analog clock to wake up by. You should not be using your phone as an alarm to wake up by. Your phone and all digital and electronic screens and such should be outside of your bedroom, okay? That's, and, and televisions in particular. The presence of a screen will reduce sexual activity in the bedroom. So again, going back to the importance of discharging one's biophysical energy, including through the sexual embrace, we wanna make sure that that is up and we don't want screens in the way. So get screens, TVs, digital, Blinking lights, modems, everything out of the bedroom. Okay, that's one thing. Um, we also know social media has a bi-directional influence on mental health, both pulling you down, making you more depressed, especially around body dysmorphia, body image, right? But then on the other hand, the research also shows it does have an effect on having people feel more connected. So you want to, this goes back to your question about mindfulness. You want to be conscious and mindful of how it's affecting you. Is it pulling you down? Is there a lot in your feed around, especially diet culture? Anything about diet culture, I would 100% ask your people, the audience, do not follow. Don't follow diet culture. Don't follow, you know, any kind of body image anything like that, unfollow all of that. Um, so you can, you know, is it helping you to feel connected or is it pulling you down? You wanna be mindful of that. The other thing is even before COVID-19, generally I advise most people to do a news fast. You can just unplug from the news for two weeks and, you know, just talking to friends and family, you'll probably find out what's going on anyway. Very true, very true. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about a news fast because most people don't think about even doing that. And right now it's something that would be super beneficial for everyone. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, thank you so much for such, um, such descriptive answers and giving us so much information about this. You know, I see a lot of questions popping up in the chat box here. So let's uh, see what questions people have for you. Ready? So I got one from Anna. She asked about mindfulness. While we learn how to be in the present moment, it helps to see all the beauty in the world. Be truly happy when we are joyful. What about when we are feeling pain? Yes. So, um, I'm, I'm, and I'd be happy to hear more from Anna about the source of the question. Uh, sometimes we get messages growing up that especially, it's very white, Eurocentric, Western and United States, which is have a smile, you know, focus on the positive. Other cultures are less inclined to that. And those of you who have traveled internationally or perhaps you're an immigrant, you know Americans are somewhat uniquely obsessed with happiness and sticking the next sweet thing in, in our mouths. So here we have this question, well, what about when you're feeling pain? I would encourage you to lean into it and to ask, well, what is this telling me? What am I grieving? What is, my, even if it's physical pain, what is this about? This is the mindfulness that Anna brought in. She framed it 
I have a question about mindfulness. It, the, the question has the answer in it, which is to come home to your innate wisdom and ask yourself, well, what is this pain saying to me? What is my distress telling me? What's concerning me? What do I need to feel? And maybe what do I need to express? Now, if you can't go to the beach and scream or you don't have a therapy you know, in which you might be able to process it, you, you scream into a pillow. You allow yourself to cry. You allow yourself to have whatever feeling is there without judgment, with the most acceptance that you can muster. Anna, does that answer your question or do you want to elaborate? <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you already unmuted me. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for your answer. Yes. Um, you know, we had a, a session with um, YPN, um, a committee as well, and um, the psychologist on that session, she, she gave us this practical tool of being very in the present moment, and she actually used a, a very common example of brushing your teeth. Um, she asked us to be so alert and uh, intuitive and uh, connected with this um, action so that we can learn to be so present in the moment, right? The toothpaste taste and sounds and temperature around and everything else. So that's after that, I had this question since we're learning to be so um, connected and so present in the moment, it's great when we're feeling great, right? In fact, we all would love to be more connected with the, the happiness. And we often, I often drift away into other thoughts. And then I think about those precious moment that I, moments that I had with my mom, who I see only once every two years. And then I feel guilty that I, that I thought about business work and other challenges and problems instead of being there. But what about when I'm feeling very sad? Then, uh, you know, I had a fear. Well, if I learn to be so present and so intuitive with myself, when I feel a lot of pain, am I going to feel more pain? I don't want to. <laughs> so that's where the, the question arose, arose from. How, how beneficial is it when you're feeling pain to be so intuitively connected with yourself? Where can I find that benefit there? Yes. I, I, I think what you're saying is there's a fear that if you were to lean into the pain, you don't know when it would end or how bottomless it might be. And that's, that's scary because if you don't distract yourself with work or like you mentioned with your mom, you know, oh, I find myself drifting away and then I feel a bit guilty. But if you are feeling some sadness, some grief, some pain, and you move deeper into it, it's a bit frightening that you might go so deep and you, you don't know when it's going to end. Um, if it feels, what I would say is if it feels unfathomable, if it feels like too much, then you will want to seek out, you know, someone who can be there with you or perhaps um, uh, some therapy, you know, uh, working in a therapeutic context around that to really be able to lean into it and to essentially flush that out so there's freedom from it. What we know is that this stuff doesn't go away. Repressing it, suppressing it, denying it, all the different psychological defenses don't result in it going away. It's just someplace else, and then it will come out in, usually in sideways, distorted. You know, then we have the acting out that I've mentioned, or the anxiety, or phobias, or other symptoms that seem kind of disconnected from the original pain. Fantastic. Anna, does that answer your question more fully and completely? Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. So let's see the other question. I believe it was from um, our Madame President, Sherry. Do you recommend not to listen to the news media on a daily basis? I I'm gonna answer that. I love that question. I'm gonna answer it going back to something that you introduced, Brie, the mindfulness. And I think the answer is, it's an unsatisfactory answer, but I'm gonna give it anyway. It depends. 
if you're okay. someone and you find, oh, you know, this is information, I take this in, I can process it, and then I move on with my day. Then that's how you tend to digest, ingest and digest and metabolize the news. If you find it's getting you worked up, and it's compromising your relationships, your mental health, your work, your exercise, your sleep at night, then it might be an indication, you, you're mindful, like you said, Brie, and then it's an indication, maybe I should reduce this or change the news source. Maybe I should be reading rather than listening, or maybe I should be listening rather than watching. I like that you include different ways to ingest the news because uh, that's a good point. I mean, I didn't think about that. I'm sure a lot of people don't think about how they take in the information. Sherry, does that answer your question? Yes, um, thank you. That was really great. Yeah, that's uh, because um, I was wondering, you know, sometimes it really gets into you when you listen to the, to the news. And I just want to ignore the whole thing, but at the same time, I want to know what's happening. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, sometimes it bothers me. And um, I was told that, especially before you go to bed, you should watch a very funny movie. <laughs> before you. <laughs> that helps a lot. But, you know, going through all this news and, you know, we have so many Zoom meetings and going through different news and different information. And sometimes you think, oh, my God, what's happening in this world? And you just want to shut down and not listen to anybody or anything, you know, for a day or so. And just be by yourself and just meditate or whatever you want to do, whatever pleases you, you know. So that's, that's I was wondering if I'm doing the right thing or I have to be there and just feel strong. And I say, no, I'm going to listen to the news every day. It's not going to hurt me, but it does, you know. At the end of the day, it does hurt me. I'm, I'm so glad, Sherry, that you brought up um, sleep because I haven't, we haven't talked that much about sleep and sleep hygiene. And when I say sleep hygiene, I mean the process, what each of us has as a routine for preparing to go to sleep. And you said, oh, you know, watch a funny movie. Definitely, and we know, again, I'm citing research, unplugging from digital media, social media, news, for, you know, anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes before you wanna fall asleep is really important. So definitely that, something lighter if you're gonna watch anything at all, so you're not getting hyped up and stimulated. Um, things as simple as just having chamomile tea or some sort of a ritual, or you mentioned, you know, maybe you just want to unplug for a day. It's that mindfulness that Brie mentioned, coming home to yourself, listening to your own inner wisdom, and then not judging yourself. Now this is hard, because we grow up in a culture, especially, I'll just look at gender for a minute, especially women with lots of judgments about, you know, guilt and selfishness and selflessness and giving and, you know, all sorts of archetypes around giving, you know, instead of receiving or taking care of oneself. So it's, we're, we're all becoming more conscious and we have to, work against those cultural uh, mandates that we've received. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. And I love how that you mentioned having these rituals, like a routine um, for bedtime, because some people say that it helps them fall asleep and it helps them sleep better. Sleep is so critical and so important biochemically, for our mental health, for our physical health. This dreams are extremely important, which is also going back to substances. Things like cannabis, for instance, over time can really disrupt the dream cycle. And it's only when we're dreaming that the neurons in our brain, it's called pruning. Basically, it's like if you think of pruning a tree and then they regrow, right, or reconnect in, in unique and new, different, better ways. All of that happens when we're dreaming. And if you're not dreaming and it's disrupted by either prescription medication or recreational drugs, all of that gets disrupted and it creates, it can create a downward spiral, you know. Yes. 
It's very interesting. You know, someone actually had a comment and they ask, well, this is on a, another subject. This is going back to fear and obsession. What are your suggestions for friends who may be having, and this is from Gloria Ramirez. Thank you, Gloria. And what she's on mute it, by the way. Great. What are your suggestions for friends who may be having a particularly difficult time with your fear and obsession? Yeah, I think, you know, this question is one of, um, how, do, how do I help people who are struggling now? And this could be anything. Gloria is bringing up fear and obsession. And I think, and again, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit along gender lines, and it's all artificially separate male, female, even though we know gender's on a spectrum. Women tend to be more uh, cult acculturated and socialized to listen and not necessarily to provide a solution. And not and and men and boys who are, you know, acculturated as boys tend to be more solution focused. Certainly, in your line of work, you all are problem solvers. When you have a friend with, who's very afraid or is fixated on something, start by listening in that sort of. Um, uh, like, you, like you're a vessel that they can pour their fears and obsessions into. And it doesn't have to stick with you. You're just listening. You don't have to come up with any solutions. If it seems, again, the mark, the line where you say, oh, I should probably seek professional help is where relationships, occupation, activities of daily living, sleep, you know, physical health start to become compromised. Then, you know, you, you reach out for professional help. My obsessions are getting so bad, I really need to talk to somebody and seek, you know, psychotherapy for this. Or I'm so fearful that it's impinging on my daily work or my relationships or I can't sleep, yeah. But my, my recommendation for Gloria would be to just be there and listen. You know, we all want to be seen and understood. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that is the connection that's lacking as, as being there for people. So I appreciate your feedback. Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, people just need to, it's so nice to all of a sudden you pop up. Hi, Gloria. Hi. <laughs> um, fundamentally, we all want to be seen for who we really are, right? And, right. to, and to just be heard. And someone's afraid, they, they want this to be received. So as a friend or a family member, you can just be there to receive that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Wonderful, wonderful. And I believe uh, Wookie with our network has a hand raised with a question. Hi guys, um, I actually have a couple of questions, doctor. Um, We've lost a lot of people, like I shouldn't say we, but as even real estate, um, to suicide. And what are some of the signs do you think that in this time that we're not seeing people daily, like that people could pay attention to that might be struggling? Because the last sign of them normally is reaching out. But like, normally if you're with someone, you can tell when things are going down, right? Or they're going spiraling down. But if you're at home and you're just talking to people, what do you think that there's some signs that you could tell that that person probably needs to be reached out to more often or something? Yeah. Um, first, I did not know that there's kind of an increase or a, a, a preponderance of suicide among realtors. This is the case. Very high. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. And I'm, I mean, I'm guessing about some of the reasons for that and you all could educate me on that for sure. Suicide. Let's talk about suicide. First of all, should be, I'd like it. I'd like to see it at, to be a word in everyone's vocabulary and that we talk. I, I know that mental health is, especially with younger generations, 
the stigma is going away. It's it's being elevated as important as physical health. You go, you know, you get you go to your gym to get exercise, you go to your therapist to maintain your mental health. I would like to see suicide, the word, become just a part of common conversation. So that's the first thing I would say is that train yourself and remind yourself that it's absolutely okay to bring this up with someone. If you have any intuition, any thoughts, any inkling, or any evidence that they may have some what we suicidal ideation, which simply means they're thinking about it, just simply ask them. Say, are you feeling suicidal? Or are you thinking about hurting yourself? Very, very, very direct. You do not have to be a professional. Ask, use the word very directly. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? You know, it's, it's common, you know, more common among realtors. And I'm just want to make sure you're okay. So you ask directly. That's the first thing. You ask specific, go ahead. Oh, I think Wookie is muted. <laughs> Sorry, I got a call, so it like shut it down. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, my next thing would be about um, domestic violence. I know is going up right now, especially because people are at home with their significant other, and they really can't. I saw someone in women's council post. I thought what was a brilliant thing was coming up with like a plan of action on a social media post to like if you text her, "Hey, meet me at, for coffee at this time," that it's calling someone or showing up at their house. Um, I know that abuse is, they said it went down a little bit, but they believe it's way higher that women are, or either or, are afraid to report abuse. And it's a bad thing that's going on right now. So what would your suggestions do? I mean, I, other than I guess coming up with a plan and posting it, I don't know can't really reach out to people and be like, are you being abused? Um, yeah, so first, the, um, what we're seeing is an increase in domestic violence um, for all the reasons you might imagine. People are cooped up um, and uh, whatever was able to distract us in the past, going out, work, going to work, going to the gym, getting our hair cut, <laughs> which I cannot wait until we can do that again. <laughs> um, whatever the distraction might be, going out to dinner, you know, going to sports and, and music events, all of that is gone. People are stuck at home together. We have definitely seen an increase in domestic violence. Um, the other problem is the shelters are packed. So even if a person wanted, usually a woman, wants to go to a shelter, you've got all the, you know, social distancing and quarantining and all that. So it's, it's very difficult. Or if they're going to go to a family or a friend's home, very, very challenging at this point. You said, oh, it, it, you know, is it okay to just ask, you know, oh, are you concerned? I, I would say similar to suicide, absolutely. Just simply ask, say, you know, I'm concerned. I'm hearing that, you know, your partner or someone at home is yelling at you. And we know that the cycle of domestic violence, it starts with yelling, maybe throwing an object, typically a phone or maybe a, a kitchen implement, um, kicking the family pet or hurting the family pet, then kicking or blocking, you know, one's entry or exit from a room and it escalates. So first sign and when, you know, tempers are flaring, you want to intervene with your friends and help them out for sure. So the best thing is just being as direct as you can without trying to, you know, hurt their feelings. So what if it's not true? Um, last question I have, I'm sorry for asking all these things, um, but what about getting back to the normal? I know as of, you know, today, a lot of retails are going um, back, opening up, but people, we've been sheltering in place for two months and going back in the fear of maybe getting this and going back to the normal, I think a lot of people might struggle they might be fine now, but struggling with the transition of going back to our new normal. What do you think that are some daily steps people could do to get back into society and start their whole normal work or new normal work? 
I, I think it's a gradual, in, gradual introduction, and I'm probably not telling you or anybody out there who's listening um, anything that you don't talk about with your friends and family or you don't already know. It's a gradual introduction. And I'll tell you who's actually quite effect, going to be very affected is children and pets. For any of you who have pets at home, you know they've become very happy that you're around so much. And suddenly, if you're going to be out showing properties, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, that's going to be a real change for them. So I would just say you want to gradually ease into it rather than there, you're not going to return to where you were two or three months ago. Yeah. So a gradual easing in. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Wonderful, wonderful. So we are getting close to that 12 o'clock hour. So Dr. Scherholz, you have been incredible. You have answered so many questions and um, just really clarified things for us. So thank you very much. What is the best way to get a hold of you for, for people that would like to do your virtual therapy sessions, I believe you had mentioned? Yes, so um, everybody in the practice right now is seeing patients strictly virtually. We have a uh, HIPAA compliant uh, video platform that doctors use to see patients, which is encrypted and confidential and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we are hoping to be back in the office in the next couple of weeks. We could have been in the office this whole time. We decided not to because we didn't want to have to wear masks. It's very important we were able to see our patients' faces and that they can see ours for emotional regulation and expression. Um, right. To answer your question, Bree, if somebody wants to reach me, um, they can go to the website, angelispsychologygroup.com. It's just like Los Angeles, but without the loss, just angelispsychologygroup.com. There's a lot of information there. Um, Anybody can set up a free initial consultation with any of the therapists in the practice, you know, or if you have, you know, uh, people were saying, you know, a friend, somebody who's fearful or is feeling obsessive, you know, have them call us and we'll, if we're not the right match, you know, we'll refer them or get people connected up for sure. That's great. That's great. And one comment I will say about that as well is Dr. Neil Scherholz is on social media and he shares a lot of his segments that he does on the news. That's actually where I saw, well, we've met um, at previous events, but I actually saw him on the news talking about these mental health issues. So I we, saw you on the news too. <laughs> <laughs> Bree, can yeah. you um, type in the chat? box his um social media face you know his um handle or facebook information for us all absolutely I'll and we and could probably it. post it on our page as well right and we'll do that as well for prepa yeah and also while she's doing that we have mindy one of our sponsors who's thanking you very much dr neil for all your wonderful insights she really enjoyed them um, enjoyed it and you have quite a bit of people saying thank you to both yes. of you. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's so much fun. And if you have more questions, reach out to me. I'm, I would be very happy to talk with any of you out there. I, I don't even know how many people are on, but hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just want to say in listening to your voice as well you have a wonderful demeanor and inflection when you speak so although I miss seeing your eyes really because um, you're right eye contact is so important oh my god I miss that a lot but um, you just reminded me of a lot of things I know and things that I needed to have right here in my frontal lobe so Thank you. It was I thought you were fantastic. Really yeah. enjoyed listening. Really, to really you. good. Really good. I love that you said frontal lobe. You're like a psychologist. <laughs> um, I'm an art major with psychology major. I was going to be an art therapist, and I ended up becoming an art dealer. So, although I fell into the real estate industry, I'm a vendor. I, um, yeah, psychology is my number one thing to like. I pay attention to people all the time, all day long. Yeah. And myself. I always slap myself like, oh, you know better. Stop. <laughs> you know? Wonderful. So well, thank, thank you. It was great. Really great. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Neil Scherholtz. We're very lucky to have you all. Thank you all so much for being with us today and stay tuned for our next one. And thank you to all of our amazing sponsors. Before we go, can um, our president would like to thank our sponsors? Let me give her that chance. I'll mute her. Let's see. Sherry. You should be unmuted. She probably has to unmute herself. Let me see. Tawny, do you want to name them? She's muted too. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay, if she... Sherry, can you... Okay, you now here I am. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that, Dr. Shareholds, we truly appreciate the valuable information you shared with us today. That was great. That was really nice. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, our dear Bree, thank you for moderating such a great presentation. It was really wonderful. And thank you for all the members that joined us today, all the guests and our affiliates. And I would like also to our strategic Partners. I start with our diamond partner in Greater Los Angeles Realtors, and our ruby one is statewide escrow. And then we come to our toss, the MLS, my NHD, C2 Financial, Fermigan, Corner Escrow, All Estate, and Glenox Escrow. Thank you very much for being with us and supporting us. And as Bree said, we are looking forward to our next event, which is coming up. June 18th, I believe. That's going to be another great one. So we see you all on June 18th. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.